and we're delighted to welcome so many people to our annual Lloyd Cox Oration, which is our most important public event in the course of the year and an important opportunity to demonstrate the critical importance of research in reproduction and early life for the health of our community. And it's named after Professor Lloyd Cox, who was the inaugural professor and head of discipline of obstetrics and gynaecology who came to Australia in 1958 and then became Dean of Medicine and was uh, a key leader in the Faculty of Medicine until his retirement in 1984. We're absolutely delighted to have Lloyd's family with us tonight and we welcome Di and Max and his son David and grandson Sam. Thank you so much for coming and continuing to allow the Institute and the University to use Lloyd's name in our public outreach. Let me introduce our speaker for this evening. We are absolutely delighted to have with us Laureate Professor John Aitken from the University of Newcastle. John is co-director of the Priority Research Centre in Reproductive Science and pro-vice-chancellor of the Faculty of Health and Medicine at the University of Newcastle. His research career began with a PhD in reproductive biology from the University of Cambridge, where he was supervised by Roger Short, another very now Australian and very famous reproductive biologist. Following postdoc positions at the Institute of Animal Genetics in the University of Edinburgh and the University of Bordeaux, he worked with the World Health Organization in Geneva and managed two WHO task forces in the Human Reproduction Unit, dealing with different aspects of fertility control. In 1977, he joined the Medical Research Council's Reproductive Biology Unit at Edinburgh and established a research group in reproductive biology with clinical outreach. He moved to Australia in 1998 and became Chair of Biological Sciences and then Director of the ARC Centre of Excellence in Biotechnology and Development and has an honorary professorship with the University of Edinburgh. He has been elected a Fellow of the Society of Reproductive Biology, the Royal Society of Edinburgh, the Royal Society of New South Wales and the Australian Academy for Health and Medical Sciences. He's also a Fellow of the Australian Academy of Science and President of the International Society of Andrology. And we think that John is a very appropriate person to speak in Lloyd Cox's name because, of course, we remember that Lloyd was so important for his understanding of how crucial it is to bring, if we want to have a better understanding of the clinical discipline of reproductive medicine, the importance of science and reproductive biology to broaden our understanding and to develop new strategies to bring developments to, for the benefit of human health. And John really manifests this uh, philosophy in his research and he's going to be talking to us tonight about the Janus faces of human fertility, how commercial interests, education and pollution are shaping the future of our species. Welcome John. Well, thank you uh, very much indeed, uh, Sarah, for the kind introduction, and thank you also for the invitation to deliver this Lloyd Cox lecture. You know, we live in very strange times. We live at a time when one in six couples, one in six couples, are consulting IVF specialists because they're concerned about their fertility. And in the same society, and at the same time, one in four pregnancies is so unplanned and unwanted that it ends in a elective abortion. Also, we live at a time when Big Pharma has essentially turned its back on human reproduction. There are no big pharmaceutical companies now working on contraception, and really we've had no radically new forms of contraception since the pill was introduced in 1960. So it's a very complex reproductive landscape, and it's that landscape that I want to investigate with you during this lecture. It's a, uh, a public lecture, so uh, the concepts I'm going to describe are quite uh, general ones and I think will be accessible to all, uh, but about two-thirds of the way 
into the lecture, I shall do a bit of a deep dive into mechanisms, about three slides, and it's just so that my cell biology friends stay awake, basically. Good on you, Ray. Yeah. So look, um, that's the overall plan. But before I talk about uh, reproduction, I just want to acknowledge uh, where we are and why we are here. So we're at the University of Adelaide. Uh, the University of Adelaide is a powerhouse for research in reproductive science. I know this because I've just spent two days listening to incredible people describe fantastic data um, through their work with the Robinson Institute. And it really has been a very uplifting experience. And I'm very grateful for the opportunity to hear everything that's been going on. Adelaide, of course, has a, a long reputation, a good reputation in reproductive science because it has a history in this area that goes back a long way. Uh, and as already been said, Lloyd Cox was your foundation professor of obstetrics and gynecology. Uh, he was somebody who was not only uh, a highly uh, respected clinician scientist and a gifted administrator, but he was also somebody who was held in great affection by the institution. And it is a genuine honor to be able to uh, give this talk in his memory. So let's uh, just talk about reproductive science then. And uh, I want to begin by looking at a map of the world at fertility rates. Every country on this map, which is colored in yellow, has a fertility rate which is at or below replacement. In other words, the only countries in the world which have actually growing populations are um, Guatemala, over, oh, I'm not sure this is going to work, yeah, Guatemala here, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, um, Yemen, Iran, and Papua New Guinea. Everywhere else, population fertility rates are low and falling. And actually, Australia uh, illustrates that quite beautifully. So in Australia, the average number of children in each family in the 1970s was about two and a half. And then um, over a period of time, it's fallen. The blue line is replacement rate. So we've fallen below replacement rate and stayed there for a very long period of time. And the question I put to you is, why is this? Why would our fertility rate be so low? And the answer is that this is a consequence of affluence. If on the same graph you plot uh, affluence in this society measured as disposable income per household, it is a mirror image of our fertility rate. The more affluent we become, the less fertile we are. And this is true all over the world. I've just come back from a fantastic trip to India. I had a great time in southern India. And I gave the Indians a talk about the dynamics of their own population. And uh, India is exactly the same. So they started off much higher than us. They had uh, much higher family sizes in the 1970s. And over the last half century, uh, those family sizes have come down. And if you extrapolate this line forward, I think they'll meet Australia in about 2025. At that point, they too will be well below replacement rate. And again, why is this? Well, it's got everything to do with affluence. If you uh, draw a map of India and look at fertility rates, the lowest fertility rates are, in, are the darker colors. So they're in the north and they're in the south. And if you plot on the same graph, affluence, which I've measured in terms of TV ownership. <laughs> it's, uh, it's exactly, pretty much exactly the same. The areas that have the lowest fertility rates are the ones which have the highest rates of TV ownership. So why would this relationship exist? Well, it could be that Indian TV is really good. <laughs> And it's so good, people would rather do watch TV than literally anything else. <laughs> but that's not the reason. The reason has got to do with the demographic transition. Let me just describe to you what the demographic transition is. If you start off with a society 
at a very low socioeconomic status. So this could be uh, London in Victorian times, or it could be Africa now. Those societies were characterized by very large families. The average family size in Victorian London was 11. Why would you need 11 children if you're living in Victorian London? Well, the answer is that in these societies at very early stages of socioeconomic development, perinatal and infant mortality rates are high. You had to have 11 children for one or two to survive, mature, find a partner of their own, have children, and pass your genes on into the next generation. As you become, as a society, more and more affluent, primary health care improves, uh, infant mortality rates come down, and as infant mortality rates come down, so family sizes come down, until you get to Australia, which is here, where you have an average family size of about 1.7. Why is this significant? Well, it's significant because in societies at a very early stage of socioeconomic development, where you have these high rates of perinatal mortality and you have large family sizes, you are constantly selecting for high fertility genes. You have to have enough fertility about you to have 11 children in order for one or two to survive and pass your genes on into the next generation. When you get to a society in our current state, where we have on average 1.7 children and they will all survive and, and uh, pass your genes on to the next generation, there is really very little selection pressure on fertility. And something we know from our work with dom domestic animals, that if you remove selection pressure on fertility, you lose it. You see that in thoroughbred racehorses, selected for athletic prowess, but absolutely hopeless when it comes to reproducing. You say the, see the same thing in dairy cattle, uh, selected for milk yield fertility. Jeremy's nodding. He knows what I'm talking about. So uh, th there is now a lack of selection pressure on fertility. And then we exacerbate that problem. We exacerbate the problem by this very high recourse to IVF. If one in six couples are consulting for IVF, this ensures that not only are we not selecting for high fertility genes, but we're making very certain that the low fertility genes are staying in the population. So it is inevitable as sure as night follows day, that uh, in developed societies, we will, we will become less and less fertile. I went to India to give a talk to the uh, Association of Clinical Embryologists. I expected uh, 100 people to be there. There were 1,000 people there. And what you're looking at is the growth of the Indian middle class. As the middle class grows, they now suddenly discover that they need assisted conception therapy. And the same thing is happening in Indonesia, the same thing happening in China. So, let's just talk a little bit about uh, IVF. Uh, I was uh, very fortunate in life, and I had a, a ringside seat as this technology was developing. It was, of course, developed by Bob Edwards and Patrick Steptoe. And the reason why they developed this technology was that in post-war Britain, a major cause of infertility was bilateral tubal occlusion. So essentially you'd get, primary health care wasn't so good. Uh, women would get pelvic inflammatory disease and as a consequence of that, their fallopian tubes would become blocked. So their solution to that problem was really quite a mechanical one. Uh, so what we'll do is we'll just take eggs out of the ovary. Uh, we will mix them with um, spermatozoa. Uh, in vitro, literally in glass, but in practice in, in, in plastic, or in a modern incarnation of this technique, uh, pioneered by Colin Matthews, who I saw somewhere around here. Um, there you are, Colin. Uh, ICSI, where you actually inject the spermatozoon directly into the egg. Uh, that achieves conception. You then allow the embryo to grow for a few cell divisions, and then you pop it back into the uterus. And this way, you bypass the fallopian tubes. And it's a very effective therapy. And uh, one of the things that we've forgotten, kind of lost in the mists of time, is just how controversial this technology was at the time when it was introduced. I can remember very uh, tall, learned professors of obstetrics and gynecology from the very north of the United Kingdom, um, standing up in meetings and saying, uh, Bob, IVF therapy is never going to work. And even if it does work, 
nobody's going to want it. And the reasoning was that uh, bilateral tube occlusion was rapidly becoming a thing of the past as we became more civilized and uh, introduced showers and all kinds of other wonderful new civilized accoutrements, uh, pelvic inflammatory disease, thing of the past, no longer had bilateral tubal occlusion. Nobody would need this technology even if we developed it. Well, how wrong can you be? Uh, this is a graph showing the uptake of assisted conception in Australia and New Zealand. Just recently, the data for 2009 were collated and released and uh, it actually shoots off the top of the graph. We are now at a state in this society, as we've already discussed, where one in six couples are having IVF therapy. Uh, one in 25 babies in this society, one in 25 babies in this society is an IVF or assisted conception baby. So it is, uh, I think, fundamental to this whole argument that the more that we use assisted conception in one generation, the more we're going to need it in the next. So I tell my students who are interested in studying reproductive biology that this is a growth industry. The more civilized we become, the less fertile we become, and the more we use IVF, and uh, uh, this is never gonna go backwards. So why is it that we have, we've got no pelvic inflammatory disease, we've not got any bilateral tubal occlusion, why do we need IVF in such uh, high frequency? Why do we use it in such high frequency? And the answer is basically twofold. This uh, slide just shows you the idealized reproductive life history of a uh, hunter-gatherer in the Kalahari, the uh, Kung hunter-gatherers. Hunter and, uh, sorry, let me go back. And, um, and a woman in modern society, let's say, in Adelaide. They are totally different reproductive life histories. So your average hunter-gatherer will have, uh, have a very short period of uh, uh, age-dependent infertility after menarche. Then she will have her first child when she is about um, seven, 19 years old. And then, on average, uh, a woman in the hunter-gatherer society will have about five children, uh, and those children will be spaced by periods of lactation amenorrhea. And then roughly at the age of uh, 32, 33, somewhere around about there, uh, they stop having children, and that's the end of that. Contrast that with a woman in our own society. In our society, you have a very long period of cultural infertility and then at the age in this society now of roughly 31 years of age, 31 years old, women start having their families. So they start having their families when the hunter-gatherers are stopping having theirs, and there's enough time to squeeze in 1.7 children before age-dependent infertility suddenly uh, comes upon us. So that's, uh, that's how it is. Interestingly enough, you know, in the, in the uh, hunter-gatherer society, uh, menstrual cycles were extremely rare. They're the norm in our society, but in the, those societies, uh, life was a more or less an alternating sequence of pregnancy and lactational amenorrhea. So this is just a graph showing fecundity of women during their reproductive life history. Women are their most fertile when they are about 19 years of age, so just when the hunter-gatherer is having her first child. And then it kind of stabilizes, and then suddenly, around about the age of 35, there's a very sudden inflection point, and fertility is very rapidly lost, and by the age of 41, 42, uh, the chances of conception are very low. Most women in IVF clinics are on this slippery slope. The average age is around 37, 38 years of age. So, they are trying to squeeze their fertility into a very, very narrow gap. And uh, I give this talk a lot uh, as a public lecture, and I'm always amazed at how little the public understands about reproductive biology. Uh, most women, I come from Cornwall, okay, and most women think that their um, uh, fertility declines slowly during life, a bit like this uh, Cornish uh, cliffscape until finally um, they kind of end up in a menopausal sea. They, they think that fertility ends with the menopause. 
That's how most women, I think, see their fertility. In fact, their fertility is, is not like that. It's uh, like this. And uh, <laughs> if you are, uh, you know, 35 years old and contemplating a family, uh, you're standing here at the top of the cliff, and your fertility will decline very rapidly, and you will hit the beach of infertility uh, quite a while before you hit the, hit the menopausal sea, <laughs> I'm afraid. So, uh, you know, this is a message that I think uh, we have to uh, get across. And the other very common misconception I see when I give these public lectures is the idea that it's okay. I can delay my childbearing years because at the end of the day, IVF will fix me up. It can't. Uh, if you look at uh, live birth rates following assisted conception, interestingly enough, the inflection point is still around about the same age, about the age of 35, and then um, fertility declines uh, quite rapidly. Uh, until around the age of 41, 42. So the um, age-dependent decline in fertility occurs in just the same way in assisted conception cycles as it does in naturally conceived cycles. IVF cannot fix you up. And of course it can't. Of course it can't. What does IVF ever do? All IVF ever does is simply put the male and the female gamete into juxtaposition, right? The reason why as women age, they lose fertility. It's got nothing to do with their eggs being found by a sperm. But it's got everything to do with the egg losing its potential for development. You can't rearrange the developmental potential of an egg by putting it cheek by jowl with a sperm. And it is the egg. So if you, uh, instead of using your own egg, use an egg from a young donor, then it is quite possible for women to carry pregnancies into their 50s and even into their 60s. Indeed, there is a, a lot of literature around about this. Uh, I don't know, are there any Italian lawyers in the audience tonight? <laughs> I hope not. This is Antonori. He's a rather unscrupulous Italian uh, clinician, uh, shown with um, one of his um, a patient who he has just implanted with donor oocytes and she has conceived at the age of 62. Uh, he offered me a job once. He said, come and work for me in my clinic in Rome. And I said, oh, why would I come and work for you? And he said, John, I have two Ferraris. I said, okay, you're talking to the wrong guy, not interested in Ferraris. So, you know, and this happens a lot. You see Halle Berry has a baby at 46, and you think, oh, that's okay. You know, if I go to the gym every day and my skin is like glass and my muscles are like iron, I should be able to retain my fertility well into my 40s. No, it's not true. Uh, she used a donor oocyte in order to conceive at that age. And there, the, the media, I think, is very guilty of uh, not accurately portraying um, what happens to... Uh, these people at, at uh, ages beyond the age of 40. So why is uh, fertility declining? We've established that it's because uh, the egg is losing its developmental potential. Why is the egg losing its developmental potential? Well, it's because as fertility comes down, uh, the rate of aneuploidy in eggs goes up. And aneuploidy just means um, basically a chromosomal mutation. So chromosomes are either lost or gained. The one that we uh, know about is trisomy 21, Down syndrome. And uh, that increases with maternal age. And it's just one example of many aneuploidies. The fact about Down syndrome is that those children survive because there is a pro-survival gene on the t chromosome 21, superoxide dismutase gene. So they survive. But there are many other aneuploidies. Years ago, I published a paper in Nature on this human embryo. It had a chromosome constitution of uh, 22X. So this was a very interesting embryo for two reasons. First, it was the first ever example of a human parthenogenome. It was a, an egg which is spontaneously developed into what looked like a perfectly normal eight cell embryo, but in fact never been fertilized. It just spontaneously decided to develop, which stimulated the Daily Mirror to phone me up the next day and say, does this mean that men are no longer necessary? <laughs> and moreover, it was uh, missing a chromosome. It was missing chromosome 15, so it's the first example of a human monosomy, or one of the first. So uh, these... Um, 
aneuploidies are occurring all of the time as uh, women get older. And if you wanted to do a, you know, an area of research which is absolutely critical, I think, for female fertility, is trying to understand the origins of aneuploidy in eggs. We don't really understand that currently. And if we did understand it, we might be able to do something to rescue this situation. And with the increased aneuploidy comes miscarriage. So as women uh, get older, so uh, the risk of miscarriage occurring uh, increases. Okay, well that's kind of uh, female infertility. Um, it's a major problem. It's a major age-dependent problem. But it's okay because Apple and Facebook have found a solution. So Apple and Facebook are going to offer uh, $20,000 to all their female employees to have their eggs frozen. And that will solve the whole issue. This is a terrible idea. It's a bad idea because you cannot guarantee pregnancy with a frozen egg. So I think they would face many lawsuits downstream as their eggs did not materialize into pregnancies. This is a terrible idea because it's not a solution, it's just a symptom. And in truth, as a society, you know, we, we deal with our biology very badly. We are the only species, only mammalian species, that stops reproducing in midlife. No other species does that. Your average laboratory mouse, rat, or feral wallaby will reproduce until the day it dies. But not humans. We stop reproducing in midlife. And somehow we have to adjust society to recognize our biology. Something has to change, and it cannot be our biological makeup. So somehow we have to recognize the, uh, the desire of educated women to have families and careers and mold society around that rather than hope that the biology can somehow be miraculously changed. So that's the female side of the equation. What about the male side of the equation? Well, uh, it's even worse on the male side. <laughs> it's becoming a very depressing talk. Um, my, uh, I, as as uh, Sarah said, I did my PhD in uh, vet school in Cambridge. And uh, my old professor of veterinary medicine used to say, if men were bulls, you know, they'd all be taken into the backyard and shot. Because uh, semen quality in your average human male is pretty appalling. In uh, most of these um, cases, of infertility, it's, it's quite, first of all, it's quite prevalent. Uh, roughly one in 20 men is infertile. It's not actually uh, the number of spermatozoa which is the key issue. Most men produce enough spermatozoa to fertilize an egg. In the case of um, male infertility, it's a rather a functional defect on behalf of the sperm. So the sperm cell can make it all the way up to the egg, but when it gets there, it kind of scratches his head and don't really know what to do. It's a functional defect. Actually, you know, when you think about it, the thing that we ask sperm cells to do is really complicated. We uh, deposit uh, 200 million of these things into the female tract, and they have the task of finding one other cell in the body. That's really hard. You think of all the thousands of cells these spermatozoa are going to bump into, and they have to ignore all of those. Uh, but the instant they make contact with the surface of the egg, they have to say, ah, this is what I've been looking for all my life, and stick tenaciously to it, and then engage in a very complex set of cellular interactions to achieve fertilization. We ask a lot of sperm cells, and in infertile men, it's not they don't have sperm, it's just the sperm they do have are incapable of this very complex, functional um, aspect of their biology. Well, we've talked a bit about uh, age and female fertility. What happens to age and male fertility? Well, this is Nanu Ram Yogi. He is the oldest father in the world. He's shown holding his latest child at the age of 96. Um, I don't know how many children he has. He has a lot of them, and he puts it all down to um, eating lots of meat, apparently. Uh, I think he's got a sneaky nephew, frankly. But, uh, <laughs> His, uh, his image uh, serves to remind us, I think, that uh, the impact of age on male and female reproduction is quite different. So in females, you see a sudden precipitous loss of fertility. 
In males, you do see a loss of fertility with age, but it's not precipitous. So there's just a couple of studies that show, show this. So on the left-hand side, I mean, yes, your left-hand side, um, we're looking at uh, spontaneous pregnancy rates in men less than 45 years of age or more than 45 years of age. And uh, what you see is it takes much longer to become pregnant if you are more than 45 years of age. So the, the, the pregnancy rates are much lower, sorry. And this is looking at time to pregnancy. And the fact is, if you're a 25-year-old woman and for some reason you've selected a partner who's over the age of 40, it's going to take you uh, much longer to achieve a pregnancy than if you selected somebody in your own age range. So fertility does decline with paternal age, but it's not a precipitous loss of fertility. But something else does happen with paternal age, which is very, very significant. And that is, um, I've already told you that in women, as they age, you see an increase in miscarriage rates. Same thing happens in males. You see an increase in miscarriage rates with paternal age. But the cause of the miscarriage is quite different. Whereas in women, you have aneuploidies, as I've already said, chromosomal mutations. In men, you have genetic mutations. Indeed, uh, there is a theory out there that the testis is the engine of evolution, that all genetic variation is generated in the male germline, never the female germline. And we kind of know this, that most genetic pathologies originate in men, not in women. So um, these are just some examples, Apert syndrome, achondroplasia, which is you know, a remarkable condition caused by one base change in the entire genome, neurofibromatosis. All of these conditions are exponentially correlated with the age of the father at the moment of conception. And we have known about these for a very long period of time because the phenotypes are so obvious. So JBS Holding you know, had a view about the paternal origin of mutations that cause achondroplasia. In the recent past, so in the last decade, we've come to understand that a whole variety of other conditions which are genetically determined are highly correlated with the age of the father at the moment of, of conception. And these are things that are much less obvious and could not have been diagnosed at birth. And the, the, I think one of the areas which is, in a way, quite exciting is complex polygenic neurological conditions, things like spontaneous schizophrenia, bipolar disease, autism, epilepsy. All these things are correlated with the age of the father at the moment of conception. I'm just showing you here the data for bipolar disease and for autism. Both of these things increase with the age of the father at conception. And then two years ago, there was a, a, an amazing paper published in Nature which explained the genetic origin of these conditions. It's the paper by Kong et al. And what's happening here, this is a, an analysis of the Icelandic population. So Iceland, as you know, went broke. Uh, didn't have any money, decided that, well, the whole nation could engage in a clinical trial. They had nothing else to do at the time. So um, this is a snapshot of the Icelandic population. On the x-axis, you have the age of the father at the moment of conception. And on the y-axis, you have the mutational load carried by the children of those men. Right? So it's a plot of the mutational load carried by children against the age of the father at the moment of conception. A couple of things we have to think about. First of all, look at the x-axis. It goes from 15 to 45. These were not old men. Well, I don't think they're old men. I think they're young men, actually. Um, they were starting at 15, and between the ages of 15 and 45, you see this linear correlation between the age of the father and the mutational load carried by the children. And when that mutational load gets to a certain level, the dots turn from black to red, and you start to see the cases of autism kick in. So this is 
quite profound. This is saying that something happens during paternal aging which has a dramatic effect on the mutational load carried by children. And it's not really old fathers that are doing this, it's just fathers within the normal reproductive age range. So, what is happening? Why are these changes in a mutational rate occurring, mutation rate in children occurring as a function of father's age. And I'm going to tell you uh, what our hypothesis is and then do a bit of a deep dive into the underlying mechanisms um, and I hope you'll be able to follow this. So, we think the starting point for these mutations that you see in the children of men as they age is the level of DNA damage in their sperm. As men age, their spermatozoa uh, exhibit more and more DNA damage. Um, this is actually a comet assay for those of you familiar with uh, DNA damage assays. There are many out there, you could use any one of them. Uh, this is just a comet assay. And essentially what it's showing is a linear increase in DNA damage in spermatozoa as a function of the father's age. Um, if you're over the age of 35, you have three or four times the amount of DNA damage in your gamete as a younger person. So as we age, men keep producing sperm, but the sperm carry more and more and more DNA damage. Then what we propose happens is that these DNA damaged sperm fertilize the egg, and then the egg has to suddenly engage in a round of DNA repair and fix up all this DNA damage before DNA synthesis starts for the first cleavage division. And if the egg makes a mistake, in that post-fertilization round of DNA repair, it will create a mutation, and that mutation will then be in every cell in the body. That's our hypothesis, and I, there's, it's a whole lecture in its own right about what the evidence is to support that hypothesis, but I just want to give you two or three slides to show you the way in which we are thinking about this now. So, First of all, about the nature of the DNA damage. What is the nature of this DNA damage? Why has the DNA become damaged? Well, it turns out to be a consequence of oxidative stress. Uh, spermatozoa generate uh, reactive oxygen metabolites. So oxygen, in its molecular form, very useful stuff. Without it, we would all die. Uh, but if you reduce it, and oxygen is the universal electron acceptor. So if it gets an extra electron, it becomes very excited, very reactive, and uh, very damaging to cells. Sperm generate these reactive oxygen molecules, and they come from the mitochondria of the cell. So sperm cells have a little part of the cell dedicated to mitochondria. Mitochondria are there. Human sperm mitochondria are terrible. They don't usually, and I'm speaking biochemistry now, so I'm not sure how many people are going to pick this up, but they only use glycolysis. They don't use phosphorylation. So they have a few mitochondria there. They're rubbish. They leak electrons all the time, and you generate lots of uh, reactive oxygen species. These reactive oxygen species start to then to react with everything in the immediate vicinity, including lipids and including DNA. So um, uh, it, this is a... A, a guanine residue, the guanine residue is the really vulnerable one. It becomes attacked by reactive oxygen species and it generates this adduct, uh, which is uh, 2 prime deoxy uh, guanosine, 8 hydroxy 2 prime deoxy guanosine, we'll just call it 8 oxo for short. Uh, that uh, base adduct is highly correlated with DNA damage in the germline. So it turns out, for reasons I don't have time to go into, that most, if not all, DNA damage in spermatozoa is not, as in most cells, mediated by nucleases. In spermatozoa, it's specifically mediated by oxidative attack. So uh, if you look at uh, human spermatozoa, uh, and plot the levels of DNA fragmentation in the sperm, it's highly correlated with the incidence of this oxidized base adduct. So DNA in human spermatozoa be undergoes oxidative damage. Once this DNA becomes damaged, uh, what is the cell going to do with it? Well, it engages in something called the base excision repair pathway, and in, this is a sort of diagrammatic version of it. And uh, just here is, there should be a red square, uh, which is the damaged base. 
And um, it's not actually showing. I guess that's because it's not projecting color properly. Anyway, uh, there would be a damage base here. The first enzyme that clips this damage base out is called OG1. Uh, sperm have that enzyme. So uh, you can find it in the nucleus, you can find it in the associated with the DNA and the uh, mitochondria, different splice variants and different in the two sites. Um, you can find the protein on a Western blot, and by mass spectrometry, you can get uh, coverage of most of the molecule. It's there as a biochemical entity, and it's also biochemically active. If you do nothing more sophisticated than just uh, throw some hydrogen peroxide at sperm cells, you see this uh, 8-oxoguanine appear in the sperm nucleus. But more importantly, you see the 8-oxoguanine appear in the extracellular space. So in other words, the DNA becomes oxidized, OG1 is activated, it cleaves out this oxidized base, releases it to the outside of the cell, generating an abasic site. The next step in the basic system repair pathway involves two enzymes, or one major enzyme in a supporting structural protein. Uh, AP1 is the enzyme, and XRCC1 is the, stru the, the structural supporting protein. Sperm cells don't have either of those enzymes, neither of them. Uh, we can find the enzyme with our antibodies very readily in jerkout cells, but sperm simply don't have it. So in spermatozoa, there this en these enzymes don't exist, and the basic excision repair pathway stalls. But happily, these two proteins are present in very high amounts in the egg. So this is A1, this is XRCC1. So this repair pathway is initiated in the spermatozoa, but then it goes to completion in the egg. The egg has the next two enzymes. But the egg doesn't have very much in the way of OG1. So by Western blot and by immunocytochemistry, we just can't find that. So if a sperm fertilizes an egg, still carrying lots of oxidized DNA, adhydroxyguanine, uh, then the egg just can't cope with it. And that base will persist into S phase of the first mitotic division, where it will induce a mutation. It's a very, very mutagenic base. So. Um, because OG1 is simply not present in the oocyte, 8 oxoguanine carried into the egg by the fertilizing sperm will not be uh, repaired. It will persist into the S phase, the first mitotic division, and there it will induce a mutation. So that is why, as men age, their sperm undergo more and more oxidative damage. The egg tries to repair that damage but can't, and the persistence of the oxidized bases into the S phase of the first mitotic division gives you the increase in mutation frequency in the offspring. Okay. Okay. So, um, so then, if, if, if this is the case, then uh, kind of anything that causes oxidative stress in the male germline is going to increase mutation rates in children. Anything. Uh, we've just focused on age because age is an obvious one and it's very easy to measure. But what about other things? Well, there are many other things that will do this. And uh, the example I put up here is smoking. So uh, if you're a man and you smoke heavily, here we go, um, your spermatozoa will have uh, much higher rates of DNA damage and it's oxidative DNA damage because this base adduct, 8 hydroxyguanine, is elevated. This doesn't stop you having children. If you have high levels of 8-oxoguanine in your spermatozoa, your sperm can still fertilize an egg. It doesn't affect your fertility. But what it does affect is the mutation rate in your offspring. And uh, this is a meta-analysis. Here we go. A meta-analysis of the relationship between paternal smoking and childhood cancer. And uh, every single study, bar this very small uh, Italian study here, all the other studies show an increased risk of childhood cancer in the offspring of men who smoke heavily. Now, that to me is a complete game changer, right? If I say to you, smoking, you think of diseases of the perpetrator. You think of coronary heart disease and lung cancer. 
But actually, what's much more sinister is if you're a man and you smoke, you are damaging your spermatozoa, and that will lead to an increase in mutational load carried by your children. That will reflect, be reflected in an increased risk of cancer. And because it's in the germline, your offspring and your offspring's offspring uh, have a chance of inheriting the same mutated genes. So we're probably all carrying around in our genes uh, great granddad's pipe smoking habit. You know, didn't die with uh, his heart attack, didn't go away with his heart attack. Uh, these things, because they're in the germline, live with us. And this is not the only thing. There are, there are many more. Um, a classic example, I think, is infertility itself. Um, many infertile men carry very high levels of DNA damage in the, their spermatozoa. And the way we address this is we just physically pick up a sperm cell and inject it into the egg. Well, by injecting the damaged DNA into the egg, you're bound to have an impact on mutation frequency in the offspring. Bound to happen. And you see this in miscarriage rates, for example. Again, this is a meta-analysis. And what it's essentially showing is that uh, there is an increased incidence of miscarriage following uh, sperm injection into the egg, not with IVF, but specifically uh, with ICSI, you get an increased risk of miscarriage. And that, I think, is telling you about the risk of using unselected spermatozoa in ICSI procedures, uh, generating increased mutational loads and that resulting in miscarriage. And we could go on. There are many, many other things, everything from uh, uh, alcohol to uh, mobile phone radiation. It frightens me to death. I go past a schoolyard. There's always little kids with their mobile phones. Electromagnetic radiation can have effects on uh, free radical generation by spermatozoa. And so uh, there is an enormous field of study to be done here. And uh, all of these things are potentially capable of increasing the mutational load in children. Okay. Uh, now for the last uh, five minutes or so, I want to uh, talk about the other side of the coin, which is, because I called it the Janus faces of human fertility, because I wanted to talk about uh, contraception as well as about uh, infertility. Uh, you'll be familiar with this kind of graph. It shows the growth of the uh, human population. It took from the dawn of time until 1850 to generate a billion people. Uh, we uh, paused very, for a very short period of time for the Black Death. But once we'd uh, figured out how to uh, unleash the energy and fossil fuels and got a handle on primary health care, there's really no stopping us. And uh, we've shot past five, six, seven billion people. We're well on our way to nine billion people. What's shocking about this is uh, the way in which uh, we have been unable to develop methods to control human fertility. As I said right at the beginning, Big Pharma has turned its back on this area. There are no pharmaceutical companies working in contraception. The fertility regulation needs of some 400 million people go unmet every year. Every year we see something in the order of 46 million abortions worldwide. And the uh, same thing happens in Australia. In Australia, we have live births somewhere around 250, 300,000. Every year, we see roughly 70,000 elective abortions. In fact, this country does not collect statistics on abortion rates. We figure out it's roughly 70,000 by going to the Medicare records and seeing what procedures were used. But we have no idea the number of abortions performed in private hospitals or informally. Uh, so this is really an underestimate. And it's an interesting relationship with, uh, with age. It's a U-shaped graph. So the women who are seeking abortions are at the very beginning or the very end of their reproductive life. For them, pregnancy was unplanned and unwanted, and they need better methods of fertility regulation. Whatever methods of fertility regulation we develop for the 21st century, they are, should be designed for a different environment than the ones developed in the 20th century. Uh, what's happening now is that uh, there is a global pandemic in sexually transmitted disease. So what we really need is to develop methods of controlling fertility that simultaneously protect the user against fertility and sexually transmitted disease. And the one that's most prevalent in Australia is chlamydia. And it's a disease that primarily affects young women between the ages of 15 and 25. 
So we need to develop spermicides, microbicides that uh, can um, both attack fertility and sexually transmitted disease. If you go to the chemist and buy a spermicide, what you buy is a horrible compound. It's called nanoxanol 9, and it uh, has its origins in the chemistry, organic chemistry of the 1920s. I have no idea why the industry consolidated, consolidated around this detergent. Uh, it is a detergent. Uh, it is spermicidal. It definitely works. It kills everything in sight, um, but, but in a very sort of unselective way. And clearly, if we are going to develop uh, better spermicides, we need things that are more sensitive than that. Uh, we've done, uh, I'm a, I'm at heart, I'm a chemist, so we made lots of organic molecules. This is just showing you the ED50 values. We have compounds in this list that are log orders of magnitude better at stopping spermatozoa than nonoxanol 9. And the interesting thing is with our compounds, we don't kill the cells, we just immobilize them. And I just wanted to show you a bit of video um, which describes one of the compounds we're using. So this is a population of sperm. They're swimming around, minding their own business, swimming around quite happily. And I come in over the top with one of our compounds. Instant immobilization. Isn't that amazing? I think that's fantastic. We, we'll show it again. It's, it's here they are swimming around. I showed this to a group of MD students in Melbourne, and they thought the sperm was suddenly jumping up and swimming again. But it's not true. It's just a loop, video loop. And uh, the instant they hit that compound, we are not killing them. We simply immobilize them. And happily, the same compounds are active against chlamydia, uh, as, as active against chlamydia as pen strep. So this is really quite encouraging. Uh, the other additional thing that we've done is to make these compounds in such a way that they are inactive but become activated on contact with semen. So this is just showing that uh, these are the compounds that are uh, totally inactive. If the sperm are present in culture medium, you add some seminal plasma and suddenly they become very active. So this enables you to completely redefine the way in which we design topical methods of contraception. The trouble with topical methods of contraception is they're always tied to coitus, and so they, you know, they're never very acceptable. With this kind of technology, we get away from that. We have um, got funding from Bill Gates, good old Bill. I, I love the way he does business. He says, uh, I don't want to know who you are, I don't want to know where you come from, and I definitely don't want to see your track record. Uh, I just want you to capture on one side of A4 your idea. And if I like your idea, I don't want to see a budget. I'm going to give you $100,000 and 12 months. And if you can validate your idea in 12 months, I'll give you a million dollars. I wrote him a letter. I said, Dear Bill, thank you so much. This is like a breath of fresh air to me. You know, in, in the Australian system, you fill in grant applications a mile high for $70,000. So we're now um, pursuing this, and uh, safety trials are in progress. So just to wrap all that up, uh, we've looked at the two sides of human fertility, both the infertility side and the contraception side. On the infertility side, affluence is the enemy of fertility. Fertility rates fall as nations become more prosperous and uh, infant mortality rates decline. As nations become more affluent, they will increasingly use IVF to address this fertility decline, which is a good thing for anybody in the industry. Uh, but the more we use IVF in one generation, the more we're going to need it in the next. And there are things there for society to think about. Uh, age is the avoidable enemy of, of, inf of infertility. Uh, we need to instigate societal change to uh, accommodate educated women and allow them the opportunity to both have children and a, uh, a career. Uh, the one thing we cannot change is their biology. And then finally, uh, I think the other side of the coin is equally important. We definitely need better methods of contraception. Big Pharma has pulled out. So if we're ever going to get better methods of contraception, it's going to be people like you. It's going to be people working in public sector research institutions that are going to come up with and validate the ideas that will give us the next generation of fertility regulations agents. And with that, I thank you very much indeed.